Good morning and afternoon, everyone. My name is Aaron Garrell, and thank you for participating in today's 937th Justice Clearinghouse webinar, Maximizing Niven's Potential in the Courtroom. During our webinar today, Bob Troyer will help prosecutors and law enforcement personnel understand how to best use National Integrated Ballistic Information Network Evidence, also known as NIBIN, in a courtroom. Bob will cover what NIBIN is and what it isn't, explain how the NIBIN process works, how it informs investigations, and how evidence derived from NIBIN can dramatically strengthen prosecutions. Bob Troyer was the United States Attorney in Colorado from 2016 to 2018. He was the first Assistant U.S. Attorney for six years before that, and in the early 2000s, he was a line criminal prosecutor that offices drug and violent crime units. While U.S. Attorney, Bob received the PSN Outstanding Contribution Award from the U.S. Attorney General for his years of pioneering work developing and deploying a highly successful NIBIN-based violent crime reduction strategy in Colorado. Over the past two years, Bob has worked with numerous policing agencies in Colorado on multiple policy issues. And before he went to law school, Bob was actually a high school teacher and a commercial fisherman in Alaska. Now, today's webinar is done in partnership with Ultra Electronics Forensic Technology. Ultra Electronics Forensic Technology is a leader in forensic analysis, providing innovative and effective solutions like its unique technology, the Integrated Ballistics Identification System, also known as IBIS. IBIS is de designed to find the needle in the haystack by discovering matches between pairs of spent bullets and cartridge cases at speeds well beyond human capacity. Now, the last few things I'd like to address with everyone is some basic housekeeping items. First, this event is being recorded and the formal presentation is scheduled to last about 60 minutes. Second, this is a listen-only event, but you can type in any questions you have through before Bob through the GoToWebinar toolbar and we'll take as many of those questions as possible at the end of the formal presentation. Also, I wanted to point out that Ultra Electronics Forensic Technology has included the NIBIN Toolkit for Prosecutors as a handout. You can find that on the GoToWebinar toolbar under Handouts. And among other things, this toolkit explains how to use NIBIN evidence to your benefit at various stages of the investigation and prosecution process. Feel free to download the document and distribute the toolkit to others involved in prosecutions with NIBIN evidence. And finally, after today's presentation, there will be a follow-up survey and we ask that you complete it. Your feedback is shared with our presenters and helps shape everything we do here at Justice Clearinghouse. And with that, I'll go ahead and turn the presentation over to our instructor for today. Bob, it's all yours. Thanks, Aaron. Good morning, afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, really excited to have so many people join. Uh, and I'll apologize in advance for not having the same uh, finely honed and trained radio voice as Aaron, but uh, you'll just have to live with that. So let's let's get going. Uh, this should be fun. Here we go. Bam, bam. Two forty caliber rounds are fired. One body lies on the ground. You're going about your business the next day driving into work. You hear a radio broadcast on the news about a murder last night in your jurisdiction. Those two 40 caliber shots. Before we talk about what you're going to do with this, how it's going to impact your professional life, let's remember the context. Uh, for this presentation in particular. It's very important as you listen over the next hour to remember the basic roles in the American criminal justice system. Up here at the top of the hourglass, all different kinds of law enforcement, numerous agencies, and I'm including criminal laboratories in this. Lots of work, specialized, highly trained, frenetic work going on to investigate and solve shooting crimes. 
from labs to local police departments to the feds, all that stuff up at, up at the top, all that information to get down to the judiciary, to get down to the public, the jurors, the, the nonprofits who will use the information and the data, the elected officials who will make decisions based on the data that comes out of the criminal justice process. All of that goes to the pinch point of the prosecutor. All of it has to flow through the prosecutor's office. It's important for everybody on this webinar, no matter whether you're a prosecutor or your law enforcement, lab personnel, parole, uh, uh, you know, an intervention, intervention a community service provider, wherever you work, it's important to understand the prosecutor's perspective on the use of forensic ballistic technology because the prosecutor is at that pinch point. So let's go to the office of the of the uh, the prosecutor at that pinch point a couple of days after he or she heard the radio news about that shooting uh, as as she drove to work. Um, you're sitting there at your desk as a prosecutor and all of a sudden in rushes a breathless detective or a breathless uh, special agent. I know we've got a couple of those in the audience today who've been that breathless special agent uh, in the past like Carlos Canino or, or the great Tommy Brandon. Uh, all of a sudden you're sitting there and in rushes uh, this detective with a bunch of paperwork Hey man, remember that shooting two days ago? Guess what? Niven links it to the church parking lot shooting from last week and to a shots fired incident from the week before. Don't you see? They're connected. I need a warrant. I need some phone orders. We need to open a case right now. We got to get this guy. We got a serial shooter on our hands. You're the prosecutor. Whoa, 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 whoa. What? <laughs> what do I do with this? What the hell is this person talking about? What is Niven evidence? Can I use it in a search warrant? Can I use it to charge somebody? Can I use it at the bond or detention hearing? Can I use it in trial? Can I use it at sentencing? Well, what we're gonna learn today, the what of today, is yes, 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 yes to all those questions. Why do you want to learn this? Whether you're in parole uh, or you work in a lab or you're a prosecutor, why do you want to learn all this? Listen, you have to learn it if you don't want all that work that goes into the top of the hourglass to be wasted. You have to learn it if you don't want your work as a prosecutor in the courtroom to be uh, uh, to be misinterpreted by a judge, uh, rejected by a judge, devalued by a judge in a way that impacts the whole rest of the country that uses this forensic technology. And uh, because you haven't learned what we're going to learn today, uh, you overstate or understate what NIBIN evidence really is. The court misunderstands it. You get a bad judicial decision, and pretty soon that trickles down and law enforcement stops using uh, this kind of technology uh, because the courts are skeptical or dismissive. So the cost is high uh, if you don't get good, both on the law enforcement and the prosecutor side. The cost is high. If you don't know how to learn how to use this stuff well, the good news is it's easy. The good news is, from a prosecutor perspective, uh, it's easy. There are just a few basic principles. Uh, the other good news is you're going to want to use it because it's extremely valuable. One thing using Niven technology uh, allows everybody involved, including the prosecutor office, to do is find and prosecute the serial shooters. Find and prosecute the most violent folks in your community. More and more jurisdictions uh, are learning through their, their use and the academic study in partnership 
with academia and others, uh, the folks are learning around the country as we learned in Denver when we got good at using Nibin, uh, that it is four to five percent of the criminals here uh, who actually pull the trigger repeatedly. So you really get a precision focus, uh, precision targeting and precision prosecution benefit and a much greater public safety impact when you use forensic ballistics to identify the most violent people that have the greatest impact from your prosecutions. We'll see as we talk today, you'll hear me use the term treasure chests of evidence. Uh, you'll, you'll learn that uh, these treasure chests of evidence that, that NIBIN links you to uh, uncover all kinds of new charges, new defendants, and better evidence for your prosecutions. Uh, as a prosecutor also, I always loved having any evidence, especially coming from uh, a man or a woman in a white lab coat <laughs> who could bolster an otherwise shaky, fearful, or compromised witness. Uh, so uh, NIBIN forensic technology, even as just underlying connective tissue in your case, can really help cases uh, involving violent crime, which often also involve uh, fearful, shaky, compromised witnesses. Uh, as we all know now also, uh, judges, juries, the public, the community, the media, uh, everybody expects in that courtroom, everybody expects to see some forensic technology nowadays. And I, I have found, uh, especially in our current environment, with anti-police rhetoric, um, lots of other political conflict and strife, uh, but especially at a minimum, uh, increased curiosity and skepticism about policing tactics that uh, the juries want to have that relieved. They, they don't want to have that on their mind during a trial. Uh, they want to be able to look at the evidence without lingering stress about, and do I have to convict somebody based entirely on the testimony of one police officer because the media keeps telling me I, I can't trust the police. Uh, and using forensic technology, again, even if it's just connective tissue, having the, the guy in the white lab coat up there saying, we went and found this other treasure chest because uh, this technology found similar shell casings, which led to a laboratory examination and confirmation that both casings came from the same firearm. And that's why we knocked on this door. And that's why we pulled this video from the ATM machine. And that's why we did all these other things. It goes a long way in relaxing the jury, giving them what they're expecting. Uh, as we'll talk about at the end also, the value of NIBIN is it allows you to, it opens up the world of your criminal environment to a much better understanding. It gives you lots of data about who these serial shooters are, uh, ages, locations, uh, time between shootings, types of guns, types of ammunition, um, the trajectory that's ordinarily followed, the criminal history characteristics that are relevant or are irrelevant. Um, and it allows you to measure your, the impact of your strategies to attack gun violence. So I like to think of the value of NIBIN like this. When I started doing gun cases in 1999, when the breathless uh, uh, agent or detective came into my office saying, you gotta do this case. We caught this guy last night, his tail light was out and we found a gun in his console. The question we were taught to ask was, how many felonies does he have? Well, if the guy had one minor felony from five years ago, I'm less inclined to take that case than if he has five aggravated felonies more recently, right? In other words, the rap sheet supposedly was a proxy for violence and danger to the community. What we've learned 
uh, and more and more people are realizing as they get the data from forensic technology is that a rap sheet is not a proxy for anything necessarily. Uh, and often you're missing your most violent guy if you're looking at the world that way. Uh, and, you know, as a result, you spend a lot of time prosecuting cases against people. You have no idea if they ever pulled the trigger. Um, another technique that, uh, that, uh, that was common, especially back then, hey, Bob, we got this guy jammed up on a gun case. But he says if we let him out, he can buy a gun from a younger guy in the gang. So we can prosecute both guys. And I say, great, let's let him out. Let's do the buy. We do the buy. We get that guy. The younger guy now has a felon in possession case because he sold us a gun. Well, you got to use the older guy at trial to testify against the younger guy then he does that this literally happened on a case of mine many many years ago he does it you convict the younger guy the younger guy's friends after trial shoot the older guy the older guy's friends after that shoot the friends of the younger guy and when the dust settles i've convicted the younger guy a felon in possession, I have no idea if he's ever pulled the trigger on any gun, ever harmed anyone with a gun, but I've got three dead people as a result of my prosecution. All right, do you wanna do that? Or do you wanna know because of Nibin, you are going after an individual who is causing the most violence, death and destruction in your neighborhood right now. So that precision prosecution value is, is uh, is enormous in my experience. Uh, a word about this toolkit that is the handout. I'm gonna track this a little bit over the next 40 minutes or so in this presentation. But uh, just so you understand this toolkit, uh, it, there's uh, my name's on it, but a lot of people uh, put a lot of work into this thing to make it useful to prosecutors and to agents, detectives, anyone, whose life Nibin touches. It, uh, it lays out the, the basic values, what Nibin is, what it isn't, how the Nibin process works, how to use it in a prosecution, and most importantly for prosecutors and, and law enforcement, I think, um, it's got five simple models that you can use as you see fit in any jurisdiction, modify it to your use, it's got a basic script you can use in any courtroom context to explain Nibin. It's got a basic, short, simple, clear language for insertion into affidavits uh, that explain Nibin uh, when you need to explain Nibin in a search warrant affidavit, for example. It's got a, a basic direct examination for a forensic firearm examiner, a basic direct examination for a case agent witness uh, when Nibin has been used. And it's got a, a full basic opposition brief if you get into a discovery dispute with your defense counsel about Nibin evidence uh, and seeking discovery of Nibin evidence. So we try to design it so it's useful, it's pretty short, and it's got material you can pull so you are maximizing the value of this technology in the courtroom uh, without making mistakes by accident. Uh, so that's the goal of the toolkit. And uh, thank you, Aaron, for making it a, a handout here for the webinar. So let's start with what Nibin is. And again, this is gonna be very basic for some people on this webinar, but I want everybody, even if you're familiar with Nibin, to understand that it's important for you guys, whether you're in the lab or you're a detective, to understand how the prosecutor is gonna see Nibin. And the prosecutor is gonna look at the basics to make sure they have the basic elemental understanding so they can use it best in the courtroom. And basically, we're just talking about a, a national automated network that finds previously unknown likely links 
between shooting events involving the same firearm. Likely links. Key language, we'll get back to that. Basically what happens is a shell casing that's been fired from a firearm is put in a, in a uh, machine that takes a high definition 3D image of that shell casing, uploads it into a database. That database in the US right now contains 4.5 million images already of bullets and shell casings. The, uh, this technology that's made by Ultra contains then a correlation engine that immediately using algorithms compares the image of that shell casing to the 4.5 million other images in the database. And the, what those algorithms do is find similarities in the marks on the shell casings. Every gun leaves a mechanical fingerprint on the shell casing when it's fired. It's distinct and unique to that firearm. And those marks, little grooves and burrs and striations and nicks, those have a depth, a size, and a distance from each other that the algorithms can compare to generate for the technician in the lab likely matches from the database. Uh, so we'll get more into how the process works in a minute, but basically that's all that Nibin is doing and it's doing it very fast. You can imagine the difference between uh, getting, that, uh, getting those images compared in a matter of minutes using these machines versus a firearms examiner with a microscope having to take everything in all the metro district jurisdictions, evidence rooms, and putting all those casings under a microscope next to the one that was fired last night. Uh, so the key thing I think for prosecutors to remember though about NIBIN is it's a search tool, a pointer system. There's fundamental mistake is often made early on in jurisdictions using NIBIN. I know I made this mistake and let me just say right now, all of these misstep, mistake type stories all come from my personal experience. <laughs> we started doing this in Denver in 2012, and these are all mistakes made by Bob. So keep that in mind. Um, uh, Nibin doesn't tell you that this gun on this shell casing on the left side of the screen definitely came from the same gun as the shell casing on the right side of the screen. It just tells you that those likely match and a firearm examiner needs to pull those two and compare them under a microscope. It searches for likely mat matches. It points the firearm examiner to the two physical things to put under the microscope. It's like a, a Google search, if you think about it. When you query Google, Google does not answer your question. It gives you a list of the most likely resources. It points you to the resources from which you can get your answer. So that's what Nibin is like. What Nibin is not is like in the drug world where the DEA lab does a mass spectrometry test that tells you definitively the test itself, the actual chemical test tells you that what you seized from dude's car is cocaine base. That's not what Nibin does. Nibin just points you to the casings for the firearm examiner to compare. It does not replace the firearm examiner. Nibin doesn't generate the expert reports itself. Nibin does not tell you, we caught Jimmy last night shooting this gun and Nibin told us Jimmy shot that gun two weeks ago. Nibin has 
nothing to do with the reliability of the firearm examiner opinion. Niven has just told the firearm examiner which casings to look at. His or her opinion that they are they are a match is an independently reached opinion that stands on its own based on the microscope. So obviously my favorite picture in the PowerPoint, this is my dog Smash. What is Smash telling me here? Is Smash telling me this is a rooster pheasant? No. Smash, and I, I'm assuming, by the way, that out of 600 participants today, we have 599 who are avid upland bird hunters like me, so this all makes sense to you. Uh, in upland bird hunting, you, you use uh, dogs like Smash to point you to where the birds are, where to walk, where to go, so you're not just wandering aimlessly around hoping to stumble across a rooster pheasant. All Smash is telling me is there is a bird I might be legally entitled to shoot about 15 yards in front of her nose. I still have to walk over there and flush that bird and see if it's one that I can shoot. That's all Nibin is, man, a pointer system. Okay. So the process, also, I know that a lot of lab people on the phone, it, it's, it, I'm not going to get into extraordinary detail about what happens in the process, but I'm going to tell you what the prosecutor perspective on the process is and the basics that folks need to understand about that process, because this is what affects how you can use it in a courtroom. The shell casing comes in from that that shooting we heard about on the radio on the way to work 240 caliber spent shell casings come into the Nibin site they get put in the machine imaged the correlation search uh, occurs the correlation engine puts as you see here on the left two shell casings the one from that shooting and the one from the database that it likely matches, it puts those up on the screen. A technician visually determines whether that appears to be a likely match. If it does, that technician calls a peer review technician, or sometimes that peer reviewer is an actual firearms examiner, calls him over and says, hey, what do you think? Do you think these are a likely match? Let's say the peer reviewer says, yes, you have two people now, trained technicians, confirming that visually there appears to be a match. The, the Niven site will call that a lead. They will give that lead to law enforcement for investigation. And the lead would just say, in our case, that those 40 cal sh uh, shells from a couple of days before, let's say in our case, uh, match a shell casing recovered from uh, a shooting in a church parking lot after a funeral two weeks ago, where 17 different guns were used and 130 shell casings were scattered all over that parking lot. Nibin also links the 40 caliber murder shells to a single 40 caliber shell found two weeks before that by itself, no injuries, no nothing, just uh, an acoustic alert sent to law enforcement. Law enforcement shows up and finds a single shell casing in a gutter. So the lead that's gonna go to the investigators just says murder shell casings match a shell casing from the church funeral shooting and a shell casing found in a gutter two weeks ago in such and such location. Now, when it's time, we'll talk about this later, to do a full lab exam, uh, to get a definitive opinion from an expert witness who could testify in court under the rules of evidence to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty that all of these casings actually came from the same firearm, that is the lab exam. So those casings go to this microscope you see over on the right, 
and a firearms examiner to do that forensic exam, uh, that firearm examiner uh, examination. Uh, let me, before we talk about the keys, the basic principles for use in prosecution, let me go back to my favorite slide and add a couple of points. We, by now, you're going to have this image of a pointing dog burned into your brain. Nibin is just like a pointing dog, okay? But uh, unlike the dog pointing to a pheasant, what does Nibin point you to? What is it Nibin is really pointing you to if you're an investigator or a prosecutor? Well, what it's pointing you to is treasure chests of new evidence. And what I mean by that is in our example, that church uh, funeral parking lot scene, that single case in the gutter, those events, let, let's say in our church shooting, uh, which is actually based on a case here in Denver, uh, 17 guns, 130 casings, guess what? Nobody was injured. Nobody got shot. Everybody ducked down behind cars and there was uh, an extraordinary degree of damage to the vehicles but not to any people. So let's say that scene was not investigated like a homicide. That shooting before that, where there's that single gun, uh, shell casing in the gutter, that was definitely not investigated at all, let alone as a homicide. So what Nibin is doing is pointing you back to those two events and saying, hey, look over here as if these are homicide events and investigate them the way you would the homicide and what's in those treasure chests are witnesses video license plate reader information gps data social media posts cell data traffic and parking data parole probation prison release data physical evidence like for example the visitor book from the funeral home when the attendees at the funeral checked in and all signed their names uh, arrest information dna prints uh, other nibin guns maybe we had 17 guns at that church parking lot any of those other guns linked to other shootings on nibin that can give us information about our more recent murder those are the treasure chests that's the exciting stuff as an investigator and a prosecutor that really opens things up in your case. Okay, so how do we use this stuff in the prosecution? Our breathless detective, I mean, just for fun, let's call him Carlos Canino. He's in our office. Carlos is talking a mile a minute about these connections, Nibin, the church shooting, the the casing in the gutter, what, what Carlos has is a lead. All he's saying really is, listen, the gun that killed this guy two days ago likely was the same gun that was used in the church, one of the guns used in the church parking lot and that shot that casing that we found in the gutter, okay? And I say likely because it's based on this visual examination and visual peer review confirmation. All right. So as Carlos sits across from me, I have to remember visual examination, visual confirmation. What, what Carlos is bringing me and asking for warrants, another kind of process, is he's bringing me a naked eye match point screen lead. This is the key for the prosecutor. You have to know the degree of examination. You have to, if Carlos is not being clear about it, you have to pin him down. If he has to make some calls, make some calls. But you have to know, are we talking about a lead? Are we talking about the next level of examination? which is a firearm examiner has actually taken all three of these casings 
or, or taken a, a casing from each of these three events and put them under a microscope and confirmed to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty that they came from the same gun. Or the final, the highest degree of examination is that examiner has not only done that with the microscope, but he's written up a re an expert opinion. Okay, so you don't wanna pin Carlos down on that immediately. And from then on, the prosecutor and the agent, anybody who's testifying about this, wants to remember, never overstate, never understate what you've got. Never, uh, the most common thing, uh, actually they're both common, believe it or not. Uh, and this happens all the time, especially as people are getting used to using NIBIN evidence. You tend, to, a game of telephone tends to happen. The lab people tell the homicide detective, based on visual comparison, it's likely the same gun that shot all, at all three of these events. When the homicide detective talks to the sergeant, the sergeant hears it's the same gun. When the sergeant talks to Carlos, Carlos hears dude shot in the parking lot. I mean, he shot the guy two days ago and he shot in the church and he shot the bullet in the gutter. So by the time Carlos talks to Bob, Bob hears if we find this guy <laughs> with this gun, he's guilty of all three of these things. And it's taken on an exaggerated life when all you really have is, at this point, a naked eye lead, a likely match. Uh, lab personnel, because of that phenomena, sometimes tend to understate it. And then an understated game of telephone happens. And by the time it gets to Bob, it's kind of like, yeah, we got this Nibin thing, but it's not admissible, and it doesn't really tell us shit, and we don't really know what to do with it, but uh, here's the case. You know, so you want to avoid both of those and just be precise about the degree of examination. And Carlos and Bob have got to hold each other to this. You got to have a relationship where you can constantly say, wait, am I hearing that right? Are we sure it's the same gun or are we still at the kind of likely match visual examination stage uh, at both sides? You know, Carlos has to be good of good at saying, hey, Bob, take a breath, buddy. Do not tell the judge Jimmy shot these guys. We don't know that yet. OK, <laughs> take a breath. Let's take it easy before we go in the grand jury room. Let's remember. It's just a likely at, uh, match. Okay, so re those are that. That's the key principle: knowing the degree of examination. Uh, this you will see that the degree of examination point is infused throughout the five models in the toolkit. The the uh, the examination of the expert witness, the the affidavit language for search warrants, etc. All right, so we know the degree of examination and we're conscious of, as prosecutors, okay, uh, I know it's a likely match or I know it's a degree of scientific certainty, firearm examiner opinion. I'm now thinking about rules of evidence and agent uh, or detective hearsay versus admissible expert opinion. So when can I use NIBIN evidence and for what? Well, as you can see from this chart, you can use NIBIN related evidence any time, pretty much. Uh, you can use both the naked eye determination, uh, a microscope confirmation of that naked eye determination, and an expert opinion throughout every phase of a prosecution. The only box here that doesn't have an X uh, is for a microscope examination at trial. The only reason I don't have an X in there is 
that's not going to be relevant. If you're in trial, you're going to be using the firearms examiner himself. So you're going to have the expert opinion. But we're going to talk about how how this goes, but just it's important to see visually if you're aware of two things, the two keys, the degree of examination and whether the rules of evidence apply to the proceeding, all your questions are answered about using NIBIN evidence. In other words, when the rules of evidence don't apply, like in grand jury, agent hearsay, precise statement of your degree of examination. Trial, on the other hand, full application of the rules of evidence. We use the fully admissible expert opinion from the firearm examiner. The beauty of NIBIN for prosecutors is this treasure chest concept. So you're going to, let's say you're going to trial on our little, on our little case. Let's just say for our little hypothetical that we started with that, uh, while the state's investigating the homicide, uh, the actual murder that occurred, uh, which is proving difficult for various reasons, you want to hook this guy up at least for felon in possession of a firearm. So you're just going to go to trial on felon in possession case because you got Carlos's search warrant. You executed the warrant. You found this gun in this guy's, you stopped this guy in his car. You found this 40 caliber handgun in the backpack in the seat next to him in his car. So you're trying him for felon in possession. And he, of course, is going to say, I didn't know the gun was there. I didn't possess it. I had no motive to possess it. I had no intent to possess it. Uh, and, and plus, even if I did possess it, I was defending myself. It was a imperfect self-defense kind of thing. Nibin treasure chests help you with all that stuff. I guarantee you every case we ever did in Colorado, you go back to that church funeral parking lot shooting, you go back to that single shell casing found in the gutter and you really investigate investigate those things witnesses video uh, the the guest book from the funeral home things are going to be in those treasure chests that help you in your simple felon in possession case refute these defenses and establish your elements okay oh wait a minute so you didn't even know that was in the backpack it wasn't even your backpack you don't even know how it got in the seat next to you you weren't possessing that handgun well interestingly uh, we went back and the firearm examiner concluded that the gun that shot that single 40 caliber round that was found in the gutter uh, is the same gun that was in your backpack and right at the exact moment that, or right in the moment after that gunshot was fired, we pulled an ATM video that's right there along the sidewalk, which you walked right toward after you fired that shot. And that video shows you with this exact gun in your hand. All right, so that's what you get from that first treasure chest that helps you in the courtroom on your simple felon in possession trial. Uh, the guest book is my favorite example because I, I just love that idea of investigators going back to that funeral home shooting, talking to employees and finding the uh, finding that all these knuckleheads actually signed the guest registry when they uh, went into the funeral. Um, and that that can lead to witnesses uh, and other evidence that help you in your simple simple case. Uh, you get self-defense refutation evidence all the time with this technology. I never fired this gun. I just had it because it's it's a bad place out here in Denver. Um, and uh, 
you can find from whether it's uh, a shot spotter system, uh, you know, Nibin leads you back to the shell casing in the gutter or leads you back to the church parking lot. But once you look at that and you get evidence from shot spotter or GPS or all those other treasure chest pieces, uh, you find something that shows uh, he has fired the gun before in as the aggressor and not in his own defense. And you can refute the self-defense on that basis. Uh, okay, so that's trial. When we're talking about charging is kind of the same thing, although no rules of evidence, so even easier to use it through hearsay testimony of a detective or a case agent. Use these same bits from treasure chests to meet the elements of your case or refute defenses. Um, detention and sentencing, uh, you know, let's be honest, prosecutors, we do a lot more detention hearings and sentencing than we do trials these days. Uh, the real money with Nibin is in bond hearings and sentencing hearings. And um, man, you know, you got prior shootings and you've got a firearm examiner or even uh, a likely link visual comparison of casings that you, allows you to tell the judge, hey, this same gun that we found in this guy's backpack was fired two weeks ago in this mass shooting in the in the after the funeral and was fired uh two weeks before that you know your honor we see an escalation here the guy's doing a little target practice at the stop sign and then a week after that he's shooting openly in public in an afternoon after a funeral and then two weeks after that uh, he's got it in his backpack as he rolls around town. Um, you know, that is, uh, that's powerful stuff for detention. And it makes, uh, in our experience out in Denver, magistrate judges and, and other judges around the country with all this bail reform stuff going on these days, it shows them this is a special person. Okay, I'm reserving pre-trial detention for my special people. I'm going to let everybody else out on bond, but this guy's special. And really, the picture you're painting for the magistrate is that he or she doesn't want any blood on his hands if he lets this person out on bond. Uh, because the prosecutor has just presented a trajectory of violence to me that gives me great pause. Same is true for sentencing. You can raise the sentencing range. You can uh, argue for sentences at the top of the sentencing range. When you put on uh, the, uh, the connective tissue, the Nibin links that connect you to the other treasure chests, and then information and evidence from those treasure chests that paint a picture uh, of a guy who is uh, on a certain pace of violence who hasn't been stopped in the past by probation or imprisonment, uh, who um, is likely is dangerous, he's likely to reoffend, he's likely associated with a criminal organization, et cetera, et cetera. So Nibin connects you to all that stuff. Um, and that's the expansive potential of Nibin with these with that uh, connective tissue that gets you to these treasure chests, you could head in the direction of more complex cases with more defendants, violent crime in, in aid of, uh, uh, of racketeering cases like we started doing here in Denver with great success. Um, uh, you know, big federal multi-defendant, uh, multi-acts of violence kind of cases. Or often, we've also done these kind of cases, you find a guy who's a serial shooter and you are sure from the Nibin evidence that he's a serial shooter, but you don't really have anything on him. None of those treasure chests had a video of him shooting the gun or a witness who IDs him as the shooter. But when you arrested him, 
he had a bullet in his pocket. So he's a felon in possession of ammunition. And, you know, the technical term when I was doing uh, 21 years ago, when I was doing gun cases federally, the technical legal term for a bullet in the pocket case was a chicken shit case. And so, I mean, somebody like Carlos wouldn't even bring me that case because I would just make fun of them forever. Now we love these cases. If all you get, if you got a guy who shot three, four, five people in your jurisdiction, and Nibin tells you that, but all you've got on him beyond a reasonable doubt, doubt is a bullet in the pocket, charge him with that and load him up on sentencing, and at least get him off the street for that felon in possession of ammunition. Okay, so that was the expansive potential stuff. Uh, we covered uh, we covered all this treasure chest concept. Uh, the treasure chest concept is, um, as you can tell, I love it, uh, and I think it is uh, really just changes in the nature of gun prosecutions from the prosecutor perspective. To get to these other evidence sources, you are required to have, at least as linking evidence, context evidence, you're required to put something on in the courtroom about Nibin getting you to that prior event. You know, Nibin and then the forensic examiner, what told you that gun was shot in the funeral home parking lot. The great thing about that is even if you don't end up with any direct evidence based on Nibin itself, your direct evidence comes from a witness in that funeral home par or the church parking lot. Uh, you get to show the jury, look how we do our job. Look how uh, CSI we are here. You know, this is not profiling. This was not based on uh, shaking down a whole neighborhood. We got to this piece of evidence because the forensic technology told us this prior event was relevant. So we connected to it in that way. And when, once we connected to it with Nibin, we found this direct evidence. And if the direct evidence happens to be the shell casings match and it was the same gun, then you got your firearm examiner. That's even better. You don't just have sort of Nibin as a context step that got you there. You have Mr. White Lab Coat himself telling the jury it was the same gun. Okay, missteps. This is simple and it follows from the basic principles. Uh, firearm examiner should never say and should never be allowed to say, I relied on Nibin to reach my scientific opinion because it's not true. Uh, the firearm examiner put those two casings under a microscope because my, Nibin told him that was a more efficient place to start. But his opinion or her opinion did not rely on Nibin. If you're fi do not inadvertently ask that and do not let a firearm examiner say that. And if they do, um, stop right there and rewind. And get a different examiner or clarify the miscommunication. Uh, firearm examiners are great at explaining why they weren't, in my experience, great at explaining that they didn't rely on NIBIN and great at explaining why they're not biased by NIBIN. Sometimes the defense lawyer would say, yeah, well, you, you say you didn't rely on NIBIN, but the fact of the matter is, you know, did you not or you knew, did you not, when you put them under the microscope, that two, two of your co-workers already said they matched. Firearm examiners are good at saying, uh, yeah, here's how I eliminate any bias that came from what those guys thought. Uh, here's how I eliminated it in my expert examination. Uh, a final misstep that prosecutors, I hope, will appreciate is um, Judges get excited about NIBIN evidence. 
which is another really cool thing about it. And uh, especially our most liberal judges in Colorado got the most excited about it because they, they're they assured that this defendant is in their courtroom because he's the most dangerous guy, not because he's from a certain neighborhood or whatever else. And so when judges get excited about stuff, sometimes they overstate things in the record. So you have to as a prosecutor, be conscious of and correct gently. And uh, with all due respect, uh, his honor, if his or her honor says, I'm giving you this sentence because Nibin told me you shot Jimmy. You have to say, with all due respect, your honor, just to be clear, Nibin linked us to the witness who established that dude shot Jimmy. Okay. So we, we can't, we can't have especially at the appellate level, uh, publish decisions out there that misstate what Niven does or else the whole system is in jeopardy. Um, final thing I'll talk about for a few minutes, circling back. So you understand those missteps are pretty simple to avoid. They follow from those core principles that we started with. Uh, and and I, I want to emphasize here right at the end, and then we have time for questions, is how amazingly valuable forensic ballistic uh, analysis, the cases it generates that, and the data it generates about the defendants and their behaviors, how valuable that can be for law enforcement and prosecutors' offices. Um, and, you know, how valuable it can be for those offices communicating with uh, community leaders, communities in general, elected officials, your bosses, the media. Uh, you do a case based on Nibin linking you to the church uh, funeral and the shell casing in the gutter, and you convict the guy, and you can say, honestly, we just convicted the most violent person in our community right now with the least possible community disruption. We didn't surge in, shut down a neighborhood and terrorize everybody. We found the guy without anyone even knowing we were doing it. It allows you to keep statistics like our jurisdiction last year convicted 12 serial shooters linked to 37 different shootings. This kind of data to measure, you, you, you learn about your shooters, uh, you learn about the, the links to the prior shootings. Uh, it allows you tremendous advantage in obtaining violence prevention grant money, uh, making good decisions about prevention and intervention and reentry. Uh, as a prosecutor, of course, it allows you to build new cases. Uh, maybe uh, the you do your felon in possession case while that murder case goes forward in the state. Uh, but what it really, really, uh, as I learned more and more about it, realized that it did for us here in Colorado, is it allowed us to understand our criminal environment. What the typical age is, what the typical juvenile history looks like, what the typical pace of shootings is for these guys, what the typical motivators and, and, and triggering events are for shootings. All of these different things you can start keeping data on and use that data to make resource allocation decisions. Uh, use that data to modify, to measure, to adjust your enforcement tactics. Uh, and all of that is a lot better than um, the guy who tells you he can buy a gun for you from a younger gangster or the case that's based on the length of rap sheet. It's better for community safety, better for the morale of your office, and it sure as hell makes you feel better about what you're doing to make your community safer. So that is what I got. Aaron? 
Bob, thank you so much for a fantastic presentation. I've got to say, we received so many positive comments during your presentation. Uh, we've we've got a ton of questions to get through, and so I don't want to I don't want to waste too much time on the preamble here, uh, folks. Don't forget to download that toolkit from the toolbar. It's also available on the webinar resource page. And we will, uh, if you don't have that URL right now, we will send that out tomorrow morning. If you have questions, go ahead and type them in through the GoToWebinar toolbar. And I also wanted to let you know that our next Ultra webinar is scheduled for December 1st when they're going to be talking about forensic lead policing. So if you're not already enrolled for that and it sounds like something you might be interested in, go interested in, go to the Justice Clearinghouse website, up to webinar schedule, and select that webinar. Again, it's on December 1st, and the title is Forensic Lead Policing. Um, okay, and uh, Bob, you should know we already have a proposal for marriage from Carlos. Um, I'm, I'm guessing <laughs> you probably know who that is. So I, I did want to start off with that very late note. Oh my God! <laughs> I know you said you had some ringers that were, ringers that were planning on attending here. So, uh, you know, I won't ask you to respond to Carlos on the webinar. It's kind of a personal. Thing, so. <laughs> All right. Our first question comes from Jonathan. Jonathan is asking: Following the Google search analogy, does Nibin provide a list of likely matches, and how yeah. many likely matches could be produced? as the Nibin database is searched? Uh, great question, and um, the answer is yes. And it provides uh, a full list. Uh, so in other words, if there are three likely matches, that's what you're going to get. If there are 200 likely matches, that's what you're going to get. Luckily for the lab technicians, it gives you what's called a rank, a rank sort list. So it gives you a list in order of likelihood of match. It sorts them uh, by likelihood of match according to the algorithms. So the technician, and that's in my example, how we came up with two different prior shooting events. You know, you hit the you hit the match first to the to the church parking lot. Uh, he's going to either later or on the spot get the peer reviewer to say, yeah, I confirm that that looks likely to me, and then move to number two on the list. And let's say she looks at that and she says, no, that's not a match. Looks at number three, nope, not a match. Looks at number four, oh, this is a likely match. Turns out that's the single shell casing in the gutter. And uh, she keeps going through that rank sort list. But uh, yeah, very good question. Got it. And then it, is there a quantitative value associated with the likely matches then? No. Got no, it. So they, so, I mean, there's a quantitative value in the sense that it's ranking them, but no, there's not, it's not assigned. There's no paperwork. Uh, the technician is not looking at it and saying the algorithm says this is a nine and the next one is a seven. Um, now, you know, firearms examiners, the the core, the one and only standard procedure for firearm, I mean, for um, firearm examiner uh, opinion is comparison microscope examination. There's a split after that uh, in terms of whether when you do that comparison, you 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 use a process that some examiners and some jurisdictions use that do lead to a quantitative value that's given to the to the similar features on the shell casing if that makes sense um it's called something like um uh i forget common common match striation testing or something like that. But the um, as far as I know, and Tom or other lab experts on this call can correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think on that visual screen when you get the rank sort list, you're also getting a quantitative number associated with each casing. Got it. So a couple of people are up. Oh, okay, I think we have consensus. 
It's a, a consecutive matching stri striation. <laughs> striation. There we go. Okay. Brenda submitted that. Thank you so much, Brenda. Thank you, Brenda. Thanks for saving me. <laughs> All right. Next question is from Lauren. Lauren says the language we have on our Niobin leads in our jurisdiction says that they are simply a lead and cannot be used to establish probable cause. Is that the language you generally have? Because it makes it difficult to use a trial, detention, sentencing, et cetera, without the full FE conclusion. No, that's bad language. Now, I'll tell you, um, the reason some jurisdictions have that language in the lab pa paperwork is that the labs are nervous, and I understand this, but labs and lab directors are nervous that the evidence will be overstated as a scientific conclusion. So the, the, the default, in my experience, uh, to be conservative and safe at labs, the default is to use that language. We stopped using that language in Colorado, and I highly recommend, if at all possible, in collaboration with your lab, to eliminate that language from um, any of the paperwork because it's 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 not accurate as stated. Um, it might be accurate to say a Nibin lead alone may not constitute probable cause. That that is okay to say, but it's just flat out wrong to say cannot be used to establish probable cause. First of all, probable cause is the judicial officer's decision. It's not the decision of someone in a lab or, or the prosecutor or the agent. So um, uh, I, I, I um, really didn't like that language. And we spent a lot of time in Colorado. And when I was on the National Governing Board, really trying to bring our partners along not to use language like that because it's, it's false. Got it. A couple of other people have submitted comments on that. Uh, Aaron suggested that, uh, not me, Aaron, someone who actually knows something about this, uh, about and I, but Aaron said the reason for that language is because some laboratories do not have a peer review system. Yeah, any lab, any lab that's a recognized Nibin site is supposed to have a, at least a minimum of one peer reviewer under the minimum required operating standards. Um, so they should there should be a peer review system. Got it. Um, and then, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah, but if if there's not, I understand the language, but the language still, I would argue, um, I would argue that the language could still be changed to say something like, um, to uh, may may not be used, may not alone be used to establish probable cause. Uh, because it's always a collection of things that establish probable cause. And this is, this is very clearly within the ballpark of one of those things that can be used. Um, but I also would say, if you don't have a peer review system in your lab, a good idea to put that in place. Really good recommendation. Okay, so a question from our friend Carlos. Carlos is asking, Bob, in your opinion, what factors are prohibiting law enforcement leaders and prosecutors from fully embracing the CJIC concept? And uh, CJIC, maybe you could even define what that, uh, what that acronym means. It means Crime Gun Intelligence Center. Um, and um, it also means some people have heard it referred to as the chicken grease center, but that's an inside joke. The crime gun intelligence center model is a model that takes uh, the laboratory and a bunch of um, a, a bunch of federal and local agent support uh, from from detectives to other personnel to personnel who link, a police department or sheriff's office or multiple police 
departments and sheriff's offices to each other and to the and to the crime gun intelligence center uh, so that there are enormous resources that could be deployed to follow up on leads and when you're following up on a niben lead the uh, the skids are already greased to get the information you need from homicide departments or gang uh, uh, gang groups within a department or whatever it might be. So the Crime Gun Intelligence Center uh, is usually based in the lab or associated with the lab. The lab generates through the workflow we discussed a lead and the Crime Gun Intelligence Center then manage, prioritizes leads and manages the following up on the leads and the preparation of those cases for presentation of the prosecutor. The, the, in my experience, what uh, has made it difficult um, to get, I mean, the crime gun, let me just say, the crime gun intelligence center model that we've used in Denver is extraordinarily successful. And there are many good ones around the country. It's, it's not just Colorado, but the good ones are extraordinarily successful, but every single one of them has gone through lessons learned, growing pains, lots of hard conversations, compromises, cajoling, persuasion, et cetera, because this finally answers Carlos's question, <laughs> because it's a lot of different agencies that have to contribute. And sometimes, I bet many of you are from jurisdictions where there are multiple laboratories. I spoke recently in South Florida uh, and a single county down there, uh, uh, somebody told me where I was speaking, has 35 different police departments and there are potentially uh, six or seven different labs with NIBIN capability that shell casings could go to in that region. So that's a lot of stuff to sort out with processes that encourage collection of all casings and inputting of all casings in a timely matter. You have to work out a lot of stuff you know, like Aaron's point about his lab and the language uh, in the NIBIN lead notifications, all that stuff is nitty gritty stuff that has to get worked out. You can't have chiefs, sheriffs, prosecutors who are fighting with each other or taking their ball and going home because they don't like so-and-so in Broward County. You know, it, it. so that's, you know, in other words, we get in our own way. There's nothing about the technology and there's nothing about its use in the courtroom that should impede maximizing its value. It's, it's, uh, it's us uh, doing a better job getting out of our own way to make the partnership work. Great. Bob, can I ask you to go to your next slide? I think that has your contact information for anyone who, if we don't get to their question today or if they want to get a hold of you after, uh, folks, you can see Bob's Gmail account and even his phone number. I love getting oh. phone calls. I'm just a I'm just an old an old guy who does odd projects. So don't <laughs> hesitate to don't hesitate to call. I'm serious about that. Don't hesitate to call me. I'd love to get call from calls from people like Aaron saying, "Hey, we have this little funky little issue. Have you ever heard of it? Can you help us out?" Uh, I love helping. So don't hesitate to reach out. Oh, thank you for your generosity. So our last question for the webinar goes to Brittany. Brittany is asking. Would it help even more if a firearms examiner does not know about the NIBIN result? We have a we have NIBIN under investigations, not under examiners. Yes, I love it, Brittany. Love it. Love it. You get the guy in the lab coat when he gets asked that question on the witness stand, gets to look at the defense counsel and said, "There, there was a NIBIN match. I didn't even know that. Huh? Interesting." Nice. All right, Bob, thank you so much. Thank you to Alter Electronics Forensic Technology and the amazing team that you have over uh, that you have over there to sponsor this webinar. Folks, again, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to Bob, or if you can't find his email address a day or a week from now, feel free to reach out to me, Aaron at justiceclearinghouse.com. Bob, before we shut down, I'll give you the final word. Good luck, folks. Keep it up. Keep working on this. Work through the hard stuff because uh, in the end, 
is real tangible improvement in public safety. Thanks for attending today. And I agree. Thank you, everyone, for taking the time to join us this morning. And with that, this concludes this morning's Justice Clearinghouse webinar. Take care, everyone, and please stay safe. Bye now.